Good day. I'm here to talk to you about biodegradation and bioremediation. And I'm going to tell you why microbes are so successful at this, uh, why they are um, used in, in bioremediation processes, and how we can engineer them uh, in systems to make them even better at what they do. So first, um, about bacterial properties that makes them good for bioremediation. First of all, microbes are everywhere on Earth. So they're in soil, water, air, and even in the deserts where you have very hot conditions, very uh, dry conditions, they can live in the cracks. And in fact, if you, if you look in the desert and you see the color on rocks, often that's due to the pigments of bacteria that are living in the crevices of the rock. The other point is that bacteria are present at enormous quantities on Earth. They are really the most successful living things on Earth. So one way to look at this is just sheer numbers. So it's been estimated that there are 10 to the 31 prokaryotes on Earth. Now one way to calibrate thinking about that is say to compare to grains of sand. Well that's not even close. The number of grains of sand on Earth is 10 to the 18. So let's assume that every planet in the Milky Way galaxy has a planet around it that has sand like Earth. Uh, if you took all 10 quadrillion planets in the Milky Way galaxy, multiplied that by the grains of sand on Earth, you'd have 10 to the 31. So that's what you have to do to get to a number that large, which is the number of bacterial cells on the planet. Now I want to give you an example of uh, how microbes, their numbers, their presence everywhere can really make a difference in terms of bioremediation. In this case, not engineered, but a naturally occurring bioremediation. So uh, 2010, there was enormous uh, oil spill off the coast of the United States at an oil platform. It exploded and the oil was spewing into the Gulf of Mexico. So this was something that uh, people were very alarmed about and many people thought that this was going to cause uh, environmental distress for years or even decades. And in fact, um, a year later, there were many beaches that looked very clean and the water was much clearer. So what happened? Well, it was uh, figured out that there were bacteria in the Gulf of Mexico that uh, were naturally good at eating oil, some because there were many oil seeps in the Gulf of Mexico so they had gotten adapted and evolved to handle that oil, to eat that oil. And then um, over time, uh, they, uh, in really a very short time, they proliferated uh, and ate a great preponderance of the oil that was there. So uh, we're interested in this. How do they do this? I mean, oil does not seem very palatable to us, but to bacteria, <clears throat> they, in fact, uh, some of them will adhere to the oil droplets, basically eat the alkanes, the single ring aromatics, the polycyclic aromatics, and, and they do this um, very efficiently. And as I said, um, this is what uh, might look like under a microscope in a, in a light field image. And, and as I said, this is what many of beaches in the, uh, the Gulf of Mexico look like um, because of this enormous capacity of microbes to eat huge amounts of material. So we'd like to use this. So one way that uh, humans uh, use this is to study the biochemistry, the microbiology uh, of the organisms that, that eat these uh, both natural products like oil as well as industrial chemicals. Uh, and a lot of that information has been compiled over a long period of time, and, and we did this uh, working myself and uh, Professor Linda Ellis uh, that started uh, 18 years ago, or 19 years ago now, the Biocatalysis Biodegradation Database. Um, so we compiled information not just from research here at Minnesota, but from all around the world, many researchers over many decades um, to better understand how microbes um, will degrade all different types of organic chemicals. And this uh, database has now been uh, taken over and it's now maintained uh, in Zurich, Switzerland, um, where it's called the AOVOG Biocatalysis Biodegradation Database. 
and uh, the database is continuing to develop and we're, we're very happy to see um, continuing developments and we hope this will continue for many many years. Now there's another feature of this database whereby we can um, use the accrued knowledge for many years of biodegradation research to then uh, extract rules and knowledge that can be used to predict the biodegradation of chemicals that have not yet been tested. Now this is important. Think about chemicals are, are being, new ones are being made all the time by industry for all kinds of uses as pesticides, drugs, um, and, and we would like to know what their fate is in the environment. So we use this pathway prediction system that we've developed and many people, thousands of people have used this around the world. And let me show you a little bit about how it works. So generally, um, the user will enter a compound. They can draw this with a, uh, an easy drawing package and then um, press go and the system will start predicting, uh, putting rules onto the structure and then predicting biodegradation reactions and then string those together to make pathways. Um, we published extensively on this, so if you want to know more how this works, um, you can look up uh, some of the many papers that have been published on this. Now, uh, just to give you an example of you know, how this is used in, in one particular example I'm going to show you is with the chemical atrazine. That's shown on the next slide. Um, in this case, it's a chemical that's used in agriculture to kill weeds. And you can see there's a lot of lines going and from different uh, metabolites. So atrazine is at the top, the parent compound. Then um, it makes, uh, can make various products. And those in turn can make uh, products. And uh, you can see that these, these pathways are overlapping. So it can get quite uh, complex, but we've been able to also put priorities, you see the green lines, the green lines would be the most likely pathways based on the, on the current knowledge. So if you follow the green, you'd see you'd just go down one pathway, um, and, and that's a pathway that's um, been well established in nature. So the pre prediction system works um, quite well. So let's see what, what uh, has been known from experimental work. So this is computational prediction which could be applied in this case to, it's, it's applied to atrazine, a known compound for biodegradation, but it can be applied to millions of chemicals, even ones that are newly underdeveloped. Um, and, and so it's used a lot by industry, by government regulatory agencies to get an idea of the fate of chemicals in the environment. Let's see how atrazine is uh, known to be degraded. Um, <clears throat> this was worked out uh, first by Mervyn de Sosa working in my laboratory and he showed that <clears throat> what bacteria do is start starting with atrazine they remove the chlorine substituent to make uh, hydroxyatrazine that's shown here and on the right and then that in turn undergoes another hydrolytic reaction to remove the N-ethyl group to make this compound anisopropyl amylide. Um, and then you see that that further reacts. Um, it was shown by Mervyn, another enzyme ATZC, that makes cyanuric acid. And then uh, Mervyn, also Betsy Martinez, working in the lab, and Jennifer Sefenik, showed that cyanuric acid is further metabolized. Ultimately, it goes to uh, ammonia, carbon dioxide, so the molecule is completely degraded. Now, we studied this further at the biochemical level. Um, so we, we looked at the first reaction, um, purified the enzyme that's involved. We've subsequently um, gotten the X-ray structure for one of the enzymes that does this dechlorination reaction of atrazine to hydroxyatrazine. And that's shown here. The, um, it, this is what you're seeing as a dimer, and the highlighted is the active site region where you see the color. Um, and so we've learned a lot about how the, the reaction works, um, what are the key residues in the reaction. So this really helps us if we want to use these enzymes, as I'll show you, to do bioremediation to know much more about their structure, their stability, their, their mechanism of action, what might inhibit them, and so forth. So here's an example, too, where we had uh, could define the active site. Um, this this uh, 
shows you the uh, bind uh, bound atrazine analog in the active site. Um, there's a zinc atom that's nearby. The zinc activates water, and it's this is the water that attacks the substrate and leads to the production of hydroxyatrazine. So by, by using these kind of tricks of using substrate analogs, we can learn a lot <clears throat> about, and then the, the x-ray crystallography, uh, we can learn a lot about the function of these enzymes and, and to be better able to, to use these per, per, um, uh, effectively. All right, now how can this be used in the environment? How can this be used in bioremediation? Well, <clears throat> it turns out that hydroxyatrazine is considered non-toxic, it's not regulated. So even just a bacterium that can do this first reaction, taking atrazine to hydroxyatrazine, can be valuable for bioremediation. So let me show you how we use that. So in this case, atrazine is used often in, in cornfields, um, so it's used to kill weeds. <clears throat> And you can see this is a very wet cornfield. If it rains early in the year when atrazine is applied, you could potentially get some running off the field into streams and rivers. It might make its way to municipal water treatment plants. And then uh, we felt that we could use then um, this atrazine degradation mechanism in a biological system, in an engineered system, in beads, that would then be put onto a sand bed filter. The water then, this is uh, something that's in normal water treatment plants, uh, very common. And so as the water goes through the filter, it's also going through the beads. And as it's passing by, the atrazine is degraded. And so it's removed and then it's not present in the drinking water. So <clears throat> what about these beads? These are, um, uh, you know, what are they? These are not naturally occurring. This is where um, the organism and the enzyme is, is put into this bead um, so that it's not released and also it's preserved um, in, a, in a more um, stabilized form. But how do we make these? So let me show you what these beads are. So um, the beads have bacteria inside them and, and it's made of porous silica. So this is a, in the middle is an electron micrograph that shows you this kind of porous, spongy structure with the bacterial cells that are trapped. So this has been broken apart. Normally the bacteria are completely um, uh, surrounded by the silica and so they can't get out, but, but chemicals and water get in, the water then gets cleaned. And we've published again on this, so you can look up some of our um, several publications if you want to learn more about how we make these. But I'll just tell you briefly uh, how we make these. Because remember, the bacteria are trapped inside. They're not just stuck onto the surface. So how do we make a structure like this? Well, it turns out it starts out, it's like it's a liquid. So we make it, and we make it into a gel. So this would be like making a certain kind of cake, right, where you have a, a liquid uh, uh, material um, that you then cook and make it into a gelled uh, food that you might eat. In the same way, we have now these silica precursors, these silicon alkoxides. Uh, we mix with the bacteria, and we may also mix some other uh, materials, polymers, and then uh, that liquid gels in the system that we make, and then the, the polymer, in, in a sense, forms around the bacteria. So the bacteria get trapped or encapsulated within the matrix, and then it can be used. Now the difference between the cooking example and our manufacturing example is that the cooking has to uh, occur at high temperature and of course we want to preserve the enzymes so we, we use materials that we can uh, encapsulate the bacteria at a, at a room temperature so it's a very gentle procedure which is essential now for, for keeping the, um, the organism alive. All right, let's see another way, uh, an application, another way we can make materials like this. Um, but first, let's, let's say, just, I'm just going to tell you briefly the, the values of making this type of uh, material. One, it separates the organism from the environment. Um, it protects the, the bacteria against releasing. So we want to keep them contained. We don't want them to 
to go through uh, the filter and get diluted. Um, it allows storage and transport. So we make beads, they're, they're dry, they can be shipped uh, in containers, and we've done this uh, to different sites. You can uh, provide stable biodegrading material um, then for, for different applications. There's many manufacturing op options. We make beads, but uh, we've also made wafers and fibers, as you'll see. Uh, and, and also this material, the silica material, is fairly inexpensive. So we can make a material that's, that's useful for bioremediation, but, but not at a, a very high price, which most people don't want to pay. They want to clean up an environment, but they usually want to pay the, the least amount uh, that they can to, to get the job done, and uh, this helps um, to do that. Now, as I, I, I sort of indicated that we make an, another material, so this is more like uh, something that you might see. This is uh, called cotton candy. Some of you might have, you know, eaten cotton candy. Um, it's it's a, basically a, a fiber of sugar, and then it usually has some flavor and colorings in it. Um, and in the process of doing this, there's a, a middle spinner that then um, basically um, jets out the, the sugar solution and then it forms these fibers. Well, we can actually do something similar with the silica material and bacteria. I'm going to show you that here on the next slide. Um, there's uh, light microscopy images on the left. Um, or actually in the upper right, I'm sorry, and then the others are electron microscope images. Um, you can see how the fibers are very thin. They're really nanofibers that then um, bow out around the bacteria that get encapsulated. Um, in the upper right is a light micrograph, and that's showing green fluorescent bacteria, GFP, that is inside the cell, so it's now fluorescent, and allows us to very nicely image the bacteria in this sort of glowing green color. And you can see that they're stacked in the fibers. Um, we can get a <clears throat> pretty high density now of bacteria in the fibers. So these would be like biocatalytic filters. You can use these, um, it almost looks like a cottony mesh. Um, and you could pack this into a filter cartridge. You could have it for um, handling gases that are coming off uh, through the filter, for example, or liquid. Um, so there, we think there are many applications um, of this type of um, material as well. And so this is something we're actively working on to promote bioremediation applications. All right, so the, this illustrates one of the benefits of <clears throat> the encapsulation process. Um, here, we have bacteria in, in the red. Um, with free cells, you get a good activity, but after about three weeks or so, the cells are, are lysing and you, and you largely lose activity. Um, but you can see with the black um, uh, points and the curves that in the beads, the, the catalyst, in this case, the atrazine degrading enzyme, stays active for a very long period of time, in this case, uh, four months, which is about as long, actually, as the student doing the work um, took time points. So he got bored after that. Um, and you can see also uh, the top graph is at room temperature, and the bottom is at four degrees centigrade. And you can see that the bacteria in the beads behave and perform better um, while they're inside the beads, and we think that this is because when the cells are encapsulated, they crack open a little bit, and they become more porous to the chemical, in this case, atrazine, so they actually show enhanced degradation rates. So this is an added benefit um, of the encapsulation uh, process. All right, so I'm just going to tell you about uh, a newer application uh, of how we want to expand the use of these materials and to biodegrade a much wi wider uh, class of materials. So this just illustrates another spill. So uh, chemical spills are um, hopefully not common, but they do occur. And uh, you know when they do, it, we really depend on bacteria to clean it up, either just bacteria in natural ecosystems, uh, if they handle it, 
or in some cases we have to intervene and engineer systems to clean up the, the chemical. In this case, um, it was a uh, coal cleaning chemical. This happened in the U.S. in the state of West Virginia. The, the structure of the chemical is shown, um, and it just illustrates that <clears throat> this can be uh, really damaging. The, the, the local waterways were closed. Um, the, people couldn't shower. They had to bring in bottled water. And so we'd really like to be able to very widely predict the biodegradation of chemicals, something I told you a little bit about, but also then to be able to very quickly engineer systems that could handle chemicals based on those predictions. And let me tell you briefly what we're doing about this area. So the idea would be to use something like the prediction system to, in this case, predict pathways, but also to we're taking that further so that we could select the ideal enzymes and microorganisms that would, that would degrade those chemicals. And then we could put those into silica microfibers that then could be deployed. And with predictions, with computer work, with a lot of knowledge built up uh, ahead of time, this is the kind of thing then we could make a prediction and make a treatment agent very, very quickly. And that's the goal, to be able to do bioremediation much more effectively and much more quickly. So part of this is to understand how different chemicals are degraded. And to do that, we're looking at the structures of, the, of many biodegrading enzymes to, to see the range of chemicals that they will biodegrade. So this is one such chemical, uh, or one such enzyme, naphthalene dioxygenase. And you see the chemical naphthalene bound in the active site. And this is possible due to the work of David Gibson, who first purified and studied these enzymes and S. Ramaswamy, who deduced the X-ray structure of these, uh, this enzyme and, and a number of related enzymes. And so from, their, from the knowledge that's generated on the structure and the mechanism of these enzymes, we can um, use now uh, software and dock other chemicals into the active site that might fit and react by getting near the iron and then also this, that's the site where oxygen would bind and be activated for reaction with these different aromatic molecules. So in fact, um, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded last year for this type of work to, to basically use computational methods for predicting um, chemical, biochemical reactions. So it's, it's, it's considered a very important tool that uh, is being used much more widely now in chemistry and biochemistry, and we seek to use this for biodegradation. So this, you see another chemical docked in the active site now. It has, a, it has three rings instead of the two of naphthalene, and this fits in, and we would predict it, it gets um, oxygenated, which it, and, and it turns out experimentally that it does. Well, what about if you now have a, a fourth ring? Well, it turns out that would also fit into the active site of naphthalene dioxygenase and would nicely get um, oxygenated. So we can use sort of the go-between of computational prediction, experimental validation, so that we can, over time, really greatly extend the use we feel of computational predictions. Let me show you some of the experiments that have been done to complement this work. Uh, for example, with this enzyme naphthalene dioxygenase, we just published recently that naphthalene dioxygenase will work on all of these um, aromatic ring structures, many of them shown here um, in, in this graphic. Um, so it's a very broad specificity enzyme. It has a very nonspecific hydrophobic active site. And there's quite a number of biodegradative enzymes that are like this. Um, and, and a number of them have X-ray structures. So we feel that this approach with naphthalene dioxygenase can be um, greatly extended um, in order to uh, do better bioremediation in the future, to do it in a much more predictive way, and to very much more quickly, when there's a spill, when there's a need to treat a certain chemical, that we can very quickly assemble the existing knowledge, make computational predictions, and then go and, and do something about the situation very, very quickly. So, uh, so that's a lot of our research now and, and where we think it's heading. So why is this important? Well, I think many of you know that um, water 
is be you know clean water especially that for drinking water for agriculture for industry for all applications um, is becoming harder to come by so uh, one really beautiful way to look at this this is um, from the United States Geological Service website that what this um, uh, person did who made this graphic was to basically calculate how much water there is on Earth and then make it into spheres that would be uh, proportional now to the actual amount of water and then to place that on a globe. So you can really get a sense of um, how precious water is. So you can see that the largest sphere is all water on Earth, including all the ocean water. The um, smaller sphere in the middle is just the fresh water. And then the smallest sphere, um, which is very, very tiny on a global scale, represents the, all the water that's in rivers and lakes all around the world, which are the major sources of water for, for many of the 7.5 billion people in the world. And we need to keep this clean, right? We need to keep this uh, in a state uh, where humans can, can use it safely. And uh, so I think that bioremediation is going to be a very important tool. It has been in the past, and I think it's going to be even more important in the future to keep our water clean, uh, not only for ourselves, but for future generations. And just to leave you with a last thought about uh, bioremediation, is that I like to think about uh, microbes as our best friends in this regard, that uh, by removing unwanted chemicals from the environment, and I'd like to make the analogy here to the, to the human immune system. So many of you know that, um, that in our bodies we produce uh, immunoglobulins that circulate in our bloodstream and uh, protect us. So by going around and binding to antigens and recognizing foreign uh, things that come into our body, they can protect us from viruses and pathogenic organisms. Um, <clears throat> and this is very important to our health. And I think just the same way, if you think on a global ecosystem scale, that, um, that bacteria are everywhere, as I've indicated. They're huge numbers, so they're uh, in, in all of these niches. And they've acquired the ability to degrade not only natural chemicals, but many of the synthetic chemicals that humans have devised. And so in the process of doing this, they keep our, help keep our planet clean. So we, if we have spills, we have discharges of chemicals, bacteria are doing their normal thing and, and metabolizing them, but they're doing us a big favor in doing so. So just to conclude, I'd like to um, acknowledge a lot of partners in this work. Um, also, I have a disclaimer here, uh, the university that I uh, work at, University of Minnesota, requires that I um, let people know that I um, have formed a startup company with a colleague, uh, Al Axon, and so we do bioremediation. So many of the things that I talked about today um, have commercial interest, although I've talked about general um, knowledge in bioremediation that uh, are things that we publish on and we, we are totally um, public about everything that we do in that regard. So um, Al, Al Axon is a major collaborator. Um, uh, his laboratory has worked and developed the silicon encapsulation technology that we use. Um, there are many uh, postdoctoral research associates that have contributed to the work on silicon encapsulation and atrazine and also graduate students some of whom I acknowledged during the course of the talk for their important contributions um, on atrazine biodegradation, and uh, also the funding sources that are important to, to make this all possible. So with that, I'll thank you very much, and uh, hope you uh, will um, be very interested in biocatalysis bioremediation and maybe uh, conduct your, your own research in this area, and good luck to you um, in your future endeavors. Thank you very much.